good morning, everyone, wherever you are, whoever you might be. My name is Andrew Brown, a barrister at Radcliffe Chambers, uh, and I'm joined by James Fagan, my colleague, much more intelligent colleague. <laughs> I don't know about that. Good morning to all of you. Good morning to James. So what we're going to be doing today is the junior program on commercial law. I'll be speaking first. I'm going to talk about the Quince Care duty and the recent case of Philip and Barclays Bank and sort of the expansion, potential expansion of the Quince Care duty. And then James will be giving a much more interesting and useful talk uh, on the new Commercial Rent Act, I should say Commercial Coronavirus in parentheses, uh, Rent Act, isn't it? 2022. Now, with that being said, I'm going to kick off. I'm going to do the dangerous thing, sharing my screen. Right. So to kick off, uh, we're going to talk about Philip and Barclays Bank PLC, recent case from the Court of Appeal, uh, of colon, an expansion of the Quince Care duty, question mark. So we're going to talk about that. So what is our plan of action? So we've got about 20 to 30 minutes to talk about this this morning. Uh, hopefully I won't speak too quickly or too slowly. But what are we going to talk about? First, we're going to talk about why is this case important? What is the Quince Care duty? Why does it actually matter? Well, it matters ultimately for fraud and the potential recovery for clients of uh, something from some party uh, if they've been defrauded of their monies, especially if those monies are gone in the wind somewhere overseas. We're going to talk about what exactly is the Quince Care duty, which is an established duty of care for banks. We're going to go through three different cases. We'll talk about the original Barclays Bank and Quince Care. We'll talk about Vergie and CIBC. Uh, and then Re Singularis, which is a Supreme Court case from uh, two years ago. And we're going to summarize the principles. Then we're going to talk about Philip and Barclays Bank. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about what the future holds and why this case is ultimately important for us today. So that's our plan, but the best, play, best laid plans often go afoul. So hopefully we'll actually manage to hit all of these things in turn. Right, so why is this important? Fraud and the recovery of assets. That's our header for this slide. You know, I've given some anodyne, fairly broad statements on there that I'll read out, but the reality is everyone here who has done any sort of commercial fraud work knows that fraud is ever present issue and increasingly fraud cases are becoming more and more sophisticated as we've gone along. Uh, they target individuals, obviously over email, over any sort of identity issues. So increasingly fraudsters are getting better and better at these things. One of the biggest issues ultimately though with fraud is not proving that fraud happened. We often are able to prove that it's very straightforward. You receive an email telling you to transfer money, you transfer it. It was not a proper email. It was someone disguised as someone else. The issue ultimately is the recovery of assets from fraud because often the fraudsters transfer those assets overseas. They go to a jurisdiction that we can't trace. They could run through multiple shell companies, whatever. The money is gone. Uh, the original money is gone. And then the question is, how do we get it back? How does a client, even if they're able to prove fraud, actually get any money back at the end of the day? The law has developed various means of dealing with this. And that's usually looking at, at sort of accessor, accessory liability. You have issues of knowing receipt. So if you're able to prove, obviously, that a third party has knowingly received the proceeds of fraud or dishonest uh, actions of some kind, uh, then you're able to go after that ultimate recipient of the funds, even if they weren't involved in the underlying fraud itself. Also issues of dishonest assistance. If someone dishonestly assists in a fraud or a breach of trust, uh, then you're able to go after that party uh, to, to essentially put the client back into funds, even if the original monies have now disappeared into the wind. Now, those are things that the law has developed over time, often out of breach of trust and dishonesty cases. But what about the practical realities? The reality is most clients, either companies or people, hold their money in banks. So is there ever any liability on banks if the bank transfers or actions a transaction which ultimately defrauds a client? At what time would the client or what time would the bank ultimately be liable to the client for having to repay their monies? Well, there are two duties for banks. Uh, and as you can see on the slide, they're quite straightforward. The first duty is, of course, one of basic agency. The bank is your agent. Uh, it holds it, your money for you, and it has to act on your instructions. And the primary duty of the bank ultimately is to act quickly on your instructions. And it must act quickly enough so as to avoid any economic loss you might suffer. What does that mean? Uh, the point of that primary duty is, say, 
you're entering into a contract or your company is entering into a contract and you need to pay some money over, you give instructions to the bank, the bank needs to action that payment. Because if they delay by a day, two days, three days, a week, whatever, that contractual possibility might disappear if you don't make payment. You know, the contract will be breached and you'll suffer economic loss. So the bank must prevent that sort of economic loss happening by acting on your instructions in a quick and reasonably speedy fashion. That's its primary duty, but it does have a secondary duty as well, which has been developed through case law. And this is the quince care duty. And we'll talk about this. We'll go through the cases that kind of give rise to that and examples of it. But ultimately the bank has also a corresponding duty under the contract between client and bank that it must use reasonable skill and care in and about executing the customer's orders, which includes not shutting one's eyes to dishonesty, nor acting recklessly. And then here's the underlying bit, which is really the important point. And the bank should refrain from executing an order if and for so long as it was put on inquiry by having reasonable grounds for believing that there was an order, that the order was an attempt to misappropriate funds. So long list there of things, but we're gonna just go through some cases to understand that. So these are the competing duties that a bank has. Act on instructions quickly, but ultimately also to do reasonable care to make sure that if it is on inquiry or if it has reasonable grounds for believing funds are being misappropriated to either slow down or make further inquiries to make sure funds are not going to be stolen. Well, this came out of a case back in the 1980s called Barclays Bank and Quince Care Limited. Uh, you'll see from the citation at the top, it's cited in 1992 in the All Englands, but the reality is it actually was in 1988. Back in the day, you didn't have sort of the automatic reporting uh, of cases on Bailey and such. Uh, and so you had to wait until some, um, some law report picked this up. And unfortunately this case took four years to get picked up. Uh, anyway, uh, so the company, basic facts of Quince Care, uh, it involves a company, the claim it was Quince Care Limited. They had a bank account with Barclays. A director of Quince Care directed Barclays Bank to transfer 300,000 pounds from the banks, uh, from the bank account to a solicitor's account. Those solicitors subsequently sent the money on to the United States into an account personally opened by the director. And you can see where this is going. The director then absconded off to the United States, like all of us best people, uh, and spent all of the money for his own purposes. When he was making the transactions, he was a well-known figure to the bank. He was a director of the company and regularly came into the bank. They dealt with him regularly. And he justified the transactions by saying, well, we're giving them to a solicitor who's acting on behalf of the company for the purchase of properties. In those circumstances, the bank said, well, okay. And they actioned the transactions. Ultimately, this was decided by Mr. Justice Stein, and I've got a huge amount of his judgment set out in uh, this slide, but essentially it is summarizing what I've already said. What Mr. Justice Stein said was that if a bank knowingly executes a transaction, knowing that the transaction is dishonest or shuts its eyes to obvious dishonesty, or in fact acts recklessly, then there's no issue. The bank would obviously be liable to, as an, essentially an accessory to the fraud. But the critical question is ultimately below that, what is the test that must apply whereby a bank might be liable for not taking reasonable steps if they don't actually know that dishonestly, but they might suspect it. And what he held ultimately is what he called a sensible compromise. A banker must refrain from executing an order if and for so long as the banker is put on inquiry in the sense that he has reasonable grounds for believing the orders and attempt to misappropriate the funds of a company. So the question is, what are reasonable grounds? And the bank doesn't necessarily have to stop the transaction forever. It just has to then slow down the transaction and take further steps, talk to the client, try to explain the situation as much as possible, satisfy itself that those reasonable doubts it might've had are actually doubts which have no foundation. And the ultimate standard is the ordinary prudent banker. So it's what we all learned in law students, you know, the ordinary reasonable man on the Clapham omnibus. It's one of these general sort of tests of reasonableness. Well, in Quince Care, ultimately, Stein decided there was no liability. So this would be a liable situ 
this is what would establish liability if the bank actually was on reasonable grounds for believing there was dishonesty. But in this case, he said there was no breach of duty because ultimately the director was well known to the company uh, and the transaction appeared legitimate on its face. So there was no reason for the bank necessarily uh, to explore things any further and potentially try to stop the misappropriation. So that involved a company, but what about personal individuals? So in the case of Virgie and CIBC Bank and Co. Limited, this involved an individual, just a person, Mr. Virgie. Uh, he gave a blank check to an associate and that associate ultimately filled in the blank check. And I should say this blank check had the signature of Mr. Virgie on it already and had been given to the associate to hold till later instructions from Mr. Virgie. This associate filled it out, put his own name on the payee uh, line. He filled in the amount to be paid as 20,000 pounds and he presented it at the bank. The bank honored the check, took money out of Mr. Virgie's account, which were at, time, at the time in funds, but by taking this money out, it put him into his overdraft and paid over the money to the associate. The associate then disappeared off into the wind. The money was gone. The bank ultimately, obviously, uh, Mr. Virgie was then in overdraft, so ultimately he was being loaned money by the bank. The bank wanted that money back, so they presented a statutory demand against him for the overdraft amount, uh, which he applied to set aside. Now, any of you who do insolvency know that applications to set aside, all you have to do is prove a genuinely triable issue. So all Mr. Virgie had to do was prove to the court that there was reason or that there was essentially a real prospect of success in him proving that the bank had breached its duty to him. Well, ultimately, the court did not set aside the set demand. The court said, well, in this case, the bank was perfectly right uh, and had reasonable grounds to believe this was a legitimate transaction. This was a check from Mr. Ber Vergie with his signature on it, which he had willingly given to his associate. The fact that the associate had then filled in the ultimate amount to be transferred, the bank would have no idea that that was a misappropriation because the signature was correct and it was the check of Mr. Virgie. So ultimately, this was another case where the bank was found not to be liable at the end of the day, because it didn't have reasonable grounds under the objective standard uh, that there might be a misappropriation happening. But in this case, what is clear is that potentially it could apply to individuals as well as companies. But ultimately, again, this was an agent. So it wasn't Mr. Virgie himself giving a direction to the bank in the same way it wasn't the company giving direction previously, it was the company's director in Quince County. Well, moving on to the Supreme Court ruling in re-Singularis Holdings. Singularis decided two years ago in the Supreme Court, basic facts here, it's a small company, it was not a small company, uh, but it was a sole shareholder company incorporated to manage the business assets of a very wealthy Saudi businessman who had a group of companies. He was the sole shareholder, but he was one of six directors. So they spread around the directorships a bit. However, the Saudi individual had uh, excessive powers as a director. He had very special powers to unilaterally action things on behalf of the company, which clearly he had set up this company as an alter ego uh, to be able to trade behind the limited liability shield of limited companies. The rest of his group and himself got into financial trouble so this individual went to his bank and instructed them to make payments of over $204 million, American dollars, to other companies in the business group. This was ultimately a misappropriation of the company's funds because there was no legitimate reason for these transfers. The company went into liquidation because all of its funds had been transferred out, and the liquidator duly claimed against the bank, Daiwa, for dishonest assistance and breach of the Quince Care duty. Well, two things happened. First of all, first instance, the dishonest assistance claim was dismissed, but Quince Care was upheld as, in what was found at first instance, the bank had been aware that the other group companies were in serious financial issues, as was the individual Saudi businessman. The bank and its managers knew that this person and his com other companies were facing uh, imminent financial ruin. And in fact, the bank admitted that it had already been monitoring the bank account to see if there were going to be any misappropriations. 
but ultimately it did nothing to stop or slow down the 204 million American dollars in transactions. So in those circumstances where it was monitoring the bank account already, it was literally on notice of a potential fraud or misappropriation and knew that the places to which the money was flowing were themselves companies in dire financial straits. The court said that this was a breach of the Quinn's care duty and the bank was liable to repay these sums uh, or at least part of these sums to the company. So this went to the Supreme Court. It was appealed up to the Supreme Court uh, and the Supreme Court ultimately upheld the first instance decision in Lady Hale in paragraph one, very usefully for those reading the, the judgment, you don't need to go very far to get this, summarized the Quinn's care duty. Now we've seen most of this, I'm not gonna read it out. But ultimately, she summarized what we've already seen. So we now have the Supreme Court establishing this as a proper duty and really summarizing it quickly as to what it is. So what do we have? We've got a summary then of the Quince Care duty. As I said, the bank owes two primary duties. It owes the primary duty uh, to act reasonably quickly on instruction to avoid economic loss to its client, but secondary, it owes a pseudo fiduciary duty to act with reasonable care and skill, which can involve delaying or raising inquiries on any transaction where it has reasonable suspicion of an attempt to misappropriate funds. The standard to judge the bank against is the reasonable banker. The line of authorities, and this is where we get interesting for Philip and Barclays Bank, is that I've cited three cases in this talk. We only have a few minutes to give this talk, and there's a lot of cases which have dealt with Quince Care. But ultimately, up until recently, all of these cases were dealing with, on their facts, agents, company directors or associates of an individual who themselves were giving the instructions to the bank rather than the company in its own name, perhaps giving something uh, or an individual coming to bank and giving the instructions themselves. So the line of authorities uh, where Quince Care had been found all involved agents of a principal giving instructions to the bank to make payment. This is very important to remember for what then happens in Philip and um, in Barclays Bank, because what the secondary literature without any real substantiation started saying, such as Paget's on banking, uh, was that Quince Care would only apply where an agent was making the instruction. So a bank would have to potentially be on notice if an agent is coming in to make instruction on behalf of a principal uh, and to look at the surrounding circumstances. Well, this is what was ultimately then fought over in Philip and Barclays Bank. So this is an APP fraud. We're gonna talk about what that is on the next slide and for how that works. But ultimately fraudsters convinced um, Mrs. and Mr. Philip, two individuals uh, who were retired and had significant amount of funds for their retirement fund. Uh, these fraudsters uh, convinced the Phillips to instigate two payments from their joint bank account, totaling 700,000 pounds to an account in the UAE. Payment instructions were given on two occasions and in person. And initially, the bank refused to action the transaction, but ultimately then action the transaction. No safeguarding questions were asked by the bank, nor scam warnings given. The money disappeared, as one would expect. It flowed out to the UAE and then disappeared and cannot be traced, cannot be gotten back. So the Phillips claimed against Barclays, saying that they breached their duty, uh, the, Qu the Quince Care duty. Barclays immediately applied for strikeout and summary judgment on the ground that they owed no duty where the client made direct instruction to them, that Quince Care would only apply where an agent made instruction on behalf of the client principal. And at first instance, the claim was struck out on this ground for one of two grounds. The second ground is irrelevant for this talk, but it was struck out on the ground that there was no agent giving instruction to the bank and principals if they give instructions to the bank, uh, can't give rise to the Quince Care. And the Phillips applied to the Court of Appeal. In the Court of Appeal, again, the bank argued that the Quince Care duty cannot apply to instructions given directly from the client themselves, but only through third party agents. Now it's important to understand the facts in this case as to why the Phillips were giving their instructions personally. And this is where APP fraud comes in. This is authorized push payment fraud sounds more complex than it is, but you yourself will have come across this if you're lawyers. We all know about these kinds of frauds. 
what happens is a fraudster committing the fraud contacts the victim and persuades them to make a payment to uh, the fraudster's bank account. And often that's done through fairly sophisticated means. So sometimes the fraudsters will tell the, the victim that there's a genuine, uh, a genuine payee has changed their bank details. This was a big thing when I first came into the bar. A lot of solicitor firms obviously uh, have their own client accounts to which clients have to pay money into, but people were spoofing solicitor firms and sending out payment details, which were incorrect. Fraudsters were spoofing the solicitor emails. You see it a lot in the construction industry and in home building. Fraudsters will essentially take over a email account of a small home builder company and will send out new invoices with changed invoice payment details and individuals who unfortunately then pay monies to the fraudsters bank account. So increasingly sophisticated matters, especially if one is not um, really looking at the details of the emails or chasing up changes in payment details by calling the, the, the person uh, rather than just relying on the email. And ultimately, the fraudster will withdraw the money from that bank account or transfer it overseas before the fraud is discovered. So unless you run off to court and get a freezing junction immediately, that money is gone. So in Philip M. Barclays, Lord Justice Burrs held that ultimately the duty will apply that even where the principal client is giving instructions directly to the bank, it doesn't matter whether there's an agent or not. And he reviewed the authorities and I put up a ton of writing here, but ultimately uh, he held that the Quinn's care duty, the principal remains unchanged whether an agent or principal gives the direction to the bank. The ultimate underlying duty of care is the same. And that if a bank has reasonable grounds for believing it's a misappropriation of funds in some way, shape or form, including an APP fraud, they're under a duty to make inquiries, to slow things down. So specifically at paragraph 30, he held that crucially the line of reasoning identified does not depend on whether the instruction is given by an agent. It is capable of applying with equal force to a case in which the instruction to the bank is given by a customer themselves, who is the unwitting victim of APP fraud. So ultimately, these are factual matters, no different from the previous cases. And so uh, the strikeout was overturned. And the case has now been remitted to the high court to deal with the trial. And it will turn on its factual matters as to whether there were reasonable grounds for the bank to suspect this was a fraud. I imagine it's going to have to look at the situation in general, whether they asked questions or not as to what the transaction was being uh, made for, whether the Phillips were asked any safeguarding questions whatsoever, and whether it was reasonable to or to not ask those questions. So watch this space to see what happens. Now, what should we take away from this? What does the future hold? Well, as I noted, the previous thought, including secondary literature, has always said that only Quintcare will only apply when an agent is making the instruction to the bank. So it limited the potential liability of banks where fraud is involved. Well, now, thanks to the Court of Appeal and Lord Justice Burrs, this is opened up. So if you are acting for people who have been defrauded money, either companies or individuals, and even if they themselves approach the bank to make the transaction, then now we have potential causes of action against the bank to recoup the funds if those monies have now disappeared, which could see an increase in the number of cases we can pursue against banks. Obviously, it's going to turn on the facts. So it involves proper analysis of what happened, what communications were given to the bank, what the bank asked, what the bank was aware of. So a decent amount of investigation is necessary in each of these cases, but it's welcome news to litigants and welcome news to lawyers because we have more things to claim for now. So fantastic. And as always, it's great to be able to try to get money back in frauds because as I started this whole talk with saying, frauds are frustrating because sometimes you can't recover anything. So I've put up a slide that says any questions. I'm not gonna take questions at this moment. Uh, we're gonna turn over to James in a second. And James then is going to give his talk on commercial uh, rent and we will then have questions at the end. But anyway, I hope that was useful. Uh, if you don't ask questions now, feel free to email me separately. My email's up there. You can find me on the website. Always happy to answer things by email, especially when I can think about them more and I've had more coffee. Thanks, I'll turn over to James. Thank you very much. Um... Yes, on to the brand new, uh, relatively brand new, it's about a month old now, Commercial Rent Coronavirus Act uh, 2022. 
Um, I'm going, my plan to, today is to give you a very brief um, introduction uh, to the Act uh, and to explain sort of what the Act seeks to do, uh, who it applies to, uh, this much vaunted, but admittedly, uh, well, I would, in my opinion, slightly weird arbitration scheme, um, how it's going to shake out cost-wise, and uh, a brief note on the codes of practice that have been published this month uh, that seek to support the operation of the Act and the um, and the arbitration scheme uh, that it introduces. Uh, 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 and so without much further ado, I, I'll, I'll just jump right into it. Um, so the Act came into force uh, last month on the 25th of March. Um, what it does is it, it replaces the restrictions that had already been in place uh, in the SEGA uh, and Coronavirus Acts from 2020, uh, which introduced restrictions on uh, recoveries and enforcements in relation to rent arrears that had arisen during the, um, the I suppose, the, the darkest parts of the recession, uh, of the pandemic uh, for businesses. It's very clearly stated in the government's uh, announcements and literature what the policy aim of the new act is. It's to preserve viable businesses and jobs. Uh, and that is going to be, as we go through, a touchstone that runs through the act and anyone who is involved in any of these uh, rent arrears cases that are proceeding to the new arbitration uh, must really focus on what information they have to hand to show what they are seeking uh, if, if, they're, if they represent a tenant vis-a-vis uh, -vis the landlord, uh, why what they're seeking would render their client's business viable and protect jobs. Um, because what the, what the Act actually goes on to do is it, it does two things. First, it ring fences certain debts, uh, and I'll get into that. And then it says that where parties cannot agree how to handle those debts, uh, either party may refer it to a binding arbitration. Um, and what, what the government has published under the, uh, the Secretary of State has for, with, with powers under the Act is a commercial, an updated commercial rent code of practice which is published on the 7th of April, along with a statutory guidance to arbitrators under this act, uh, which seeks to deal with uh, essentially how those arbitrators are to exercise their functions, uh, but also goes on, both of those codes of practices uh, go on to give uh, indications as to what type of evidence parties should be putting forward in their, um, in, in their references to, to, to the arbitration scheme. Um, so, turning to applicable tenancies and rents, uh, this is covered by Section 2 of the Act. Um, in effect, it applies to what are known as business tenancies, and uh, business tenancies for the purposes of this Act are those tenancies to which uh, Part 2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 applies, but also uh, the, the premises must be tenant occupied and it must be occupied uh, for carrying on a business. Um, so it, 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 it's slightly different um, to the um, definitions you may have become familiar with under the Coronavirus Act as to uh, which, which types of business tenancies uh, were, were exempt from enforcement. Uh, there are some exceptions in part two uh, of the Landlord and Tenant Act. Um, they tend to be very specific types of, of property. Um, I, I'm not gonna go into the detail of them. It's just be aware of them if, when, when you have to check whether your client comes in. Um, there are a couple of interesting questions though in the definition uh, of applicable business tenancies. The first is, well, what about uh, those business tenancies that are said to be contracted out? Uh, and that's because under uh, Section 38A, I believe, of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, uh, parties are able to contract out of the uh, provisions in relation to uh, continuation and renewal under Sections 24 to 28 of that Act. But of course, um, that's all that parties can contract out of. And so it's arguable that even if you have a contracted out business tenancy, it may still constitute a business tenancy for the purposes of this Act, because the remainder of Part 2 of the 1954 Act uh, will apply to it. Um, but, of course, being the government as it is, 
uh, they can't do anything um, straightforward. And so there are some uncertainties I, in relation to the applicability of this act. And that comes down to the decision not to copy the uh, Coronavirus Act's definition uh, which uh, of relevant business tenancies. Uh, because under the Coronavirus Act, um, its provisions will apply to those business tenancies covered by part two of the 1954 Act, if uh, there was a lawful occupier um, who is the tenant. But that lawful requirement doesn't appear in the uh, in the new Coronavirus uh, Commercial Rent Act. And so it, it then follows that perhaps uh, unlawful assignees or under tenants uh, may be able to uh, come in with under the protections and the moratoriums that are granted by uh, this new act. Uh, the second uncertainty actually relates then to uh, when must at what point in time must your tenancy be said to be a relevant uh, business tenancy? Um, and that's because is it the date at which the uh, rents which are covered by the act accrued or is it the date at which you refer to arbitration? Of course that may have an impact on those um, tenants who have outstanding rents under a lease uh, where the tenancy has expired because if if that's happened and then you go to arbitration you may have set a situation where the, the landlord may try and argue actually the protections don't apply uh, you're no longer a relevant business tenancy you cannot refer to arbitration so uh, it may you may see cases coming out of this act that try and, and deal with that question uh, in terms of what the rents are uh, section two, uh, one, it's amounts paid for use and possession, service charges and interests. Uh, it includes VAT and amounts paid for services, repairs, insurance costs and management costs. And then insurance costs gets its own definition. And it includes uh, loss of rent insurance uh, and premises and common part insurance. Uh, so it's actually quite, a, I would submit, quite a wide uh, definition of um, various uh fees and, uh, and interests that are covered by this act, which uh, is very tenant friendly. So we then get to the question of, well, you may have rent arrears, but are they protected? So what the act applies to is this concept of unpaid protected rent debts. Uh, and for a rent debt to come into that definition, uh, the business has to be adversely affected by coronavirus and the rent has to be attributable to the protected period. These are two separate but linked concepts. The first is adverse, uh, adversely affected by coronavirus. This isn't a uh, sort of a factor-based analysis of how an individual business uh, was was doing during the period of the uh, of the pandemic. Um, it, it looks specifically at whether a business or a premises was subject to a closure requirement. Um, so we all remember when nightclubs and garden centres and places like that were told they're non-essential businesses and they have to close. That's the type of closure requirement uh, that the Act is focused on. And it, and it basically says it has to be a closure requirement during the relevant period, which is from the 21st of March 2020 uh, through to uh, the 18th of July in England or the 7th of August in Wales. Um, but it, 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 it's not the whole of that period that's protected because protected period is, is, is itself separately defined uh, under section five in this act. Uh, first of all, there's a long stop uh, for, of the 18th of July and the 7th of August. However, if the business that's said to be affected uh, was subject to a shorter period of closure um, under specific restrictions, and that excludes the requirements that I'm sure we were all uh, commonly seen of uh, displaying information or, or the general restrictions that applied at large across the country, um, then that will actually be a shorter protected period. Um, and so the, the protected period for nightclubs is different to garden centres, uh, is different to other non-essential uh, businesses such as tattoo parlours. So uh, if you ever, if you have one of these cases come across your desk, uh, you need to be absolutely clear as to what restriction your client uh, or, or the tenant says they were under, uh, and when did it end? Was it uh, one which basically didn't end until the summer of last year, or did it end at a different period? Uh, and uh, finally, uh, paragraph seven of uh, Schedule Two of the Act uh, clarifies that where a landlord receives uh, rents, uh, 
the payments are to go towards unprotected rent first. Uh, so that prevents landlords trying to pay down rent arrears in order to escape the moratoriums. Uh, so that, those are the rent periods that are protected. So uh, how does the arbitration scheme uh, work? Well, there's approved arbitration bodies. Uh, these were approved at the end of March and they include uh, the usual suspects, RIC and, and SIARB. Uh, you also see some consumer arbitration uh, bodies that have been granted permission by the Secretary of State to take on these uh, cases. Um, and I think as well, uh, Balkan Chambers arbitration is also an approved arbitration body. Um, one of the first interesting things about, I think about uh, how the scheme's been set up that makes it uh, slightly unexpected is it's only going to apply for a period of six months uh, from the date of the act uh, coming into force. So um, part, anyone who's affected by it um, has only until the 25th of September to make a reference to arbitration. Uh, that may be extended by the Secretary of State, um, but until we get closer to that period, we don't know. So I, I would expect that parties may continue to try and negotiate, and it isn't until nearer the, uh, the end of the six months that we start to see a flurry uh, of, of references to the arbitration bodies. Um, it, 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 in terms of referring, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward approach. It's the usual to give a notice of an intention to arbitrate uh, and, and allow 14 days uh, for response. Uh, but what must be included with this is the formal resolution proposals. Uh, so these are effectively what the parties say they want, um, if whether it's a landlord or a tenant. So it's it's what type of relief in relation to the rent arrears is being sought uh, or is being offered. Um, there's a 14 day period for the other party to respond if they want. And either party, once they've submitted their formal proposals, uh, has up to 28 days to amend them. And uh, there's a, in section 10.3, uh, you cannot commence an arbitration under the act or appoint an arbitrator uh, where they're, the tenant is subject to a CVA, individual voluntary arrangement, schema arrangement, or restructuring plan. Um, and, and that's because we have um, some fairly significant moratoriums uh, in place under the Act uh, to prevent landlords relying on certain remedies. Uh, and, and so it's, a, it's, an, it's an attempt, I think, by uh, the draftsman to ensure that where there's already been a um, decision taken to compromise the debts of the um, of the tenant, uh, th that will be respect respected. Otherwise, uh, here's what landlords cannot do until the end of uh, September or 25th of September this year. Um, they can't make a debt claim in civil proceedings. They can't use the commercial rent arrears recovery power. Uh, they can't enforce with re-entry or forfeiture, and they can't apply the tenant's deposit towards arrears. Um, it's a, that this moratorium is in force until 25th of September. Um, any debt claims that were commenced on or after the 10th of November, uh, but before the passing of this act, uh, may be stayed. Um, where there's been a judgment uh, on or after the 10th of November uh, last year, it can be referred to arbitration under this scheme. And so if the arbitrator then decides to make an award of relief uh, of the arrears, uh, that in effect will alter the judgment and that's specifically provided for in Schedule 2 of the Act. Uh, so it's effectively it's almost a second bite of the cherry, uh, but it, it supports what this Act is trying to do, which is it's not an Act saying you can basically wipe away arrears, those, those debts and rents were never due. It's instead trying to say, well, there's an acceptance that the tenants have to pay this rent, uh, but if if it will protect their business and save jobs, render the business viable, then that that sort of um, legally beyond, uh, binding obligation may be modified. Um, similarly, there's restrictions on, uh, on winding up petitions and bankruptcy uh, petitions. Uh, and interestingly, if there was a bankruptcy order made uh, in relation to what is now a protected rent debt on or after the 10th of November last year, that bankruptcy order will be void. So what is it that the arbitration scheme can uh, do? Well, it's very narrow. Um, 
Section 13 uh, restricts what awards an arbitrator can make by effectively narrowing down what the arbitrator can do. Um, there are a couple of circumstances where the uh, arbitrator must dismiss any reference made to it. Uh, and the first of these is where the parties have agreed a resolution. So they've, they've entered in negotiations, someone's referred to arbitration, uh, but then by the time the arbitration rolls around, they've effectively settled it. Uh, or it must be dismissed where there's it's not a business tenancy or if there's no protected debt rent. So those uh, two gateway provisions uh, that we discussed earlier uh, under section two uh, have to be met uh, or else there'll be a dismissal. Uh, there must be a dismissal if the tenant's business is not viable and would not be viable even if the relief sought is granted. Um, but you met the, the arbitrator may grant relief if they find that the business is viable uh, or it would become viable. And so what's, what's gonna be crucial uh, for anyone involved in this is getting in as much evidence as possible um, in line with the guidance set out in, in, the, in the guidances I'll bring you to, um, to show that the business is or is not going to be uh, saved by what the tenant is proposing. Um, and so it, it, it's always important, I think, on, when you come to this act uh, and any arbitration under it, to be keeping one eye on, well, what's going to happen in the event that this rent is written off or reduced uh, or is, there's time to pay? I mean, what, what does the business look, did the business look like before the pandemic? What did it look like during the pandemic? And what's its likely um, the hood of actually uh, trading again after uh, the restrictions have res uh, subsided. Um, but uh, this, the, the fact that section 13 sort of narrows things down um, is, is, is in, I think, sort of hammered home by section 14. Uh, and this is what I've, I've, I've termed on rails decision making, uh, because it's very limited in terms of what the arbitrator can do. And indeed, there are certain circumstances where their hands are tied. Um, so the arbitrator can only do uh, one thing. Um, it can the arbitrator can grant relief uh, from payment of the protected debt rent, uh, rent debt, or they cannot. Um, so it's a binary option. But there are certain circumstances where um, they have to choose one party's proposals over another, uh, and that's uh, because the arbitrator is required to consider uh, the final proposals that accompany the uh, reference to arbitration. And those must be consistent with what are called the section 15 principles, uh, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, but where the arbitrator says that, or comes to the conclusion that only one set of proposals is consistent with the principles, the arbitrator must make the award as set out in that proposal. Uh, and it's only where both of them are consistent uh, that, they that they can choose uh, they are free to choose between them and what they determine is the most consistent proposal uh, for, for basically rescuing the business. Uh, and then it's only where neither party has made a proposal that's consistent with the principles that uh, the, the arbitrator can make an award really of their choosing. Um, so when, when one comes to refer a case to arbitration under the scheme, uh, it'll be incredibly important that the parties take stock and really plan out what they're putting forward uh, in their section 11 proposals. Uh, what is it they say is required to get the business up and running again uh, or to, to protect it? Um, uh, and uh, just to make it clear that any award under, the, um, un uh, under this act has the effect of altering the terms of the tenancy in respect of that uh, protected rent debt and that's section 14.9. So what are these arbitrators principles under section 15? Uh, awards have to be designed uh, and aimed at either preserving or restoring the viability of the business of the tenant. So far as it is consistent with preserving the landlord's solvency, uh, the tenant has to be, um, the second principle is the tenant should be required to meet the obligations uh, to pay protected rent in full and without delay so far as it is consistent with the preservation and restoration principle. So effect, in effect, what, what the arbitrator is faced with is when he receives proposals, um, he needs to first determine, well, would these preserve the business uh, or restore the viability of the business? 
Um, and if so, would that be consistent with the, uh, the, the solvency position of the landlord? And that's on the cash flow basis. Uh, so whether the landlord can pay his debt as they fall due. Um, but also the, the, the arbitrator has to take into account that, well, the tenant is, is sort of legally obliged to, to pay the rent um, and it has to pay them in full and on, on time. Um, so there's a, there's a slight tension there because really if the, the, the tenant uh, couldn't pay, well, then they may not actually have a, a viable business. Uh, but if, if, the, if the arbitrator thinks, well, actually, there needs to be a little bit of write down to get them up and moving, um, then they're free to, to, uh, to, to make that award. Um, what's interesting is, is Section 15 specifically carves out that the, the arbitrator must disregard anything done by parties to manipulate their financial affairs. So there's obviously a concern that uh, somewhat um, maybe dishonest or um, kind of parties who want to chance their arm will have kind of muddied the waters in order to try and escape paying their rents. Uh, so if the arbitrator gets any wind of that, uh, they have to disregard that and try and focus on the true uh, picture. Uh, but when it comes to this concept of viability, again, the act is prescriptive as to what's to be considered. Um, the, this is what's contained in section 16. It sets out definitions of what's uh, relevant in relation to uh, viability and solvency. Um, it's not nothing surprising. It's assets and liabilities, it's rental payments, the impact of coronavirus on the business, and any other information the arbitrator considers appropriate. Um, uh, but in terms of solvency, again, it's just assets and liabilities and any other uh, relevant information. Uh, but what's interesting, and I think is a tension uh, that will come out in relation to the guidance that's been published is the arbitrator must disregard the possibility of the uh, tenant either borrowing or restructuring their business. So it's very much a focus on, well, what is this business? Um, what does it generate? Over what time frame does it generate? How was it doing before the coronavirus uh, came into our lives and its life? Um, what did the coronavirus do to it? And once that's, you know, the impacts of the restrictions are gone, what's the outlook like? Um, so that's that's kind of the arbitration scheme um, and how it kind of operates in the decision making in a nutshell. I think it's fairly clear that it's it's quite quite narrowly defined. Um, it's 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 not as wide ranging as I think some people might have thought it might have been. Um, it's very much a I think an accounting exercise um, because it's, it's it's really looking at um, what the business is able to do, uh, what it's able to generate, uh, and, and how it's able to pay its debts. So it it it, it kind of it, it's different, I think, to what most lawyers would necessarily think of when they think of an arbitration, um, because at the end of the day, it's not about what's legally due and owing. It's about well, can can this business be rescued? Um, and, and, and is granting relief uh, in, from its, its rent. And specifically that includes writing off in whole or in part the rent debts, uh, giving time to pay, including by installments or reducing interest even as far as zero. Um, would any combination of those actually help the business be viable um, in relation to those protected rents over that period of about 15 months? Um, in relation to oral hearings, they're not automatic. Uh, oral hearings are by request. Uh, they're in public unless otherwise agreed and hearing fees are to be split 50-50. Interestingly, awards and reasons must be published. So many people, when they think of arbitration, think that arbitration is confidential. Uh, this is automatically public. Um, uh, the, the, the expectation uh, coming out of the guidance is that the arbitration bodies will uh, facilitate the publication of awards either on their websites or otherwise. Um, there is a requirement that confidential uh, information uh, is excluded from the public judgment or public award. Um, and that confidential information, um, especially there's two limbs to the definition. First, it's information relating uh, to commercial information uh, or the private affairs of an individual, first limb. Second limb is 
it has to be that in, if it were to be disclosed, it may, it must or might significantly harm legitimate business interests or individual interests of the person to whom it is related. Um, the, the fact of the matter is arbitrators are going to be heavily reliant on the parties to identify what that uh, confidential information is. Uh, again, the default rule is that arbitration fees uh, are going to be split 50-50, but the arbitrator may award a different proportion. And I think significantly, each party must meet their own legal or other costs. Uh, a landlord cannot recover the costs of going to this arbitration uh, via any term of the tenancy. Uh, so what that means is this potentially could be very expensive for everyone involved. Um, uh, and it, I think it's 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 it certainly is something that I think might take a lot of people by surprise. We're normally used to a loser pays principle in this jurisdiction, um, but you know this is how the act's been designed. It's it's it is quite different to anything we've seen before in this country. Uh, in terms of the uh, additional guidance, um, the commercial rent code of practice effectively exists for the benefit of the landlords and the tenants. And it's there to show uh, and to maybe guide and give sort of ideas how to approach negotiations and what evidence should be sought out um, and, and provided uh, if you go to arbitration. And the statutory guidance to arbitrators gives guidance on the exercise of the arbitrator's functions. Uh, and what comes out of this guidance, I think, from a lawyer's perspective uh, is in relation to the evidence. Uh, what is stated is that the evidence should be proportionate to the scale and complexity of the tenant's business. So a small little coffee shop, for example, um, you shouldn't expect a detailed uh, big five auditor company uh, report on uh, expected profitability. Um, but that might be appropriate if it's a very large business, uh, maybe a, a, a large manufacturing business, something like that. Uh, in terms of viability, uh, there's also a table of uh, indicators of evidence for assessing viability that can be found in the guidance. Um, that includes accounts, uh, documents which show cash flow and profits. So there, here comes your forecasting, uh, examples of long-term contracts, balance sheet strength. So we're looking at uh, working capital, liquidity and gearing ratios. And then I think this is where the... Um, the tension I referred to earlier crops up, debt commitments, uh, because one of the things that's pointed to is, well, was the uh, tenant ever offered uh, or sought out any credit? Uh, did, uh, did they refuse it or were they refused? Um, which slightly jars, I think, with the uh, arbitrator's requirement not to take into account uh, the possibility of borrowing. The only way I think that can be squared is if whether the debt commitments uh, evidence is more focused on the question of, well, in the past, how viable was this business? Can it really be expected to grow or was it already in a pretty rough state uh, before uh, the coronavirus uh, came on the scene? Um, so having said all that, well, what's the whole purpose of this act? Uh, I think given how restricted its remit is, uh, given how short uh, its kind of life is going to be, um, and given the expense of it, it's really, I think, there to just ramp up negotiating pressure on those landlords and tenants who have not been able to come to an agreement before now. Um, it, it, it's not really there to wipe away contractual obligations. Uh, it's very, very much going to be focused on technical issues of solvency with, with reference to the, a company's finances. Um, I think it's going to play into divergent interests. I think landlords are going to want to hold out uh, as long as possible in the hopes that the clock runs out. But I think tenants are going to want to refer this to arbitration if they think that actually um, they could do with some form of debt relief. Um, it's definitely, I think, going to be expensive. Um, the fact that there's no real cost recovery and that the general rule is everything is split 50-50, um, it, 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 it makes, I think, the decision whether to go to arbitration or to simply agree a negotiation, it changes that to, I think, focusing more on negotiating. Um, 
who will be appropriate arbitrators. As I said, this isn't necessarily a, all about law, it's more about finances. So I think parties will be more likely to select those with an accounting background. Um, in terms of how big this could be, well, the government's impact assessment in uh, November of last year, the final impact assessment, is that they expect something in the region of 7,500 cases uh, under this option of slightly restricted as to the period, but with binding arbitration for those who refer to it. Um, and it could it could require up to 12,000, uh, 1,200 ar arbitrators. So even though it's only going to be around for a short time, and I think even though uh, there's this issue of expense, the, the government does think it's going to be uh, resulting in quite a lot of cases. Uh, and the final point I'd note is that it the Act doesn't really deal with those tenants who may have multiple landlords um, or, a, a, across various different properties. Uh, you can consolidate cases under this Act, but uh, it's not going to be automatic. It's going to have to require the agreement of all the parties, um, which I think is slightly a hangover from how arbitration usually works, rather than the government deciding to uh, put in place something that might actually work. Um, so uh, that's that's all I have to say. A, a brief whirlwind whistle stop tour of a new act. Um, let's see what happens to protected rents once the moratorium ends. Uh, well, simply regular enforcement applies. All those things I said a, a landlord cannot do um, means that they, suddenly they can go to court. They can use the CRAR. Um, they can apply against the deposit. So the, I think the thing to watch out for is whether there'll be an extension. Uh, granted, because the, the Act does empower the Secretary of State to do so. And um, is the debt written off or contractual sum for immediately due? No, yeah, it, it, as I said, it, it basically, it's currently, there's a stay on any enforcement pending this, but if if there's no referral, no res resolution, it, it it's basically back to the usual course of business. Um, if, during the referral window, if the landlord simply sits there. Uh, no, I think that's the same question. Um, basically, if you do not refer to arbitration, and if you do not agree how to deal with it by contractual settlement, uh, and there's no extension of the Act and the moratorium, by 26th of, November, of September this year, uh, it's, it's enforcement in the usual way. But I think that's why uh, any tenant who thinks their landlord is stonewalling them will probably just refer it to arbitration. Um, uh, because it might be in their interest to do so. Okay, if there's no other questions, um, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions over email, um, but I'd like to, for, on behalf of Andrew and myself, uh, Ragnar Chambers, thank you for uh, joining us this morning for uh, another of our much wanted junior programmes. Uh, it's thank you from me. Uh, I think thank you from Andrew. Yes, thank you from me as well. Uh, and wish you all a very nice uh, sunny April day.